Okay, great. So hi, everyone, and welcome uh, for this third uh, episode of the Refractive Surgery Basic Webinar Series that we are organizing with the I Department of uh, uh, Adassa Medical Center in Jerusalem and uh, the Laser Institute of Fental Adassa. Uh, we love to bring uh, the greatest mind in refractive surgery uh, to discuss some of the hot topic. Uh, and the episode three is focused on ectasia screening and risk factors and try to get some pearls from uh, the best uh, to avoid uh, this uh, complication. Now, <clears throat> as uh, Marconi said, it's kind of a family meeting here. Uh, so I'm very, very happy uh, to get uh, on the stage, even though it's virtual, but still, I'm so happy to see you guys. So I'm uh, feeling that we are uh, kind of around the, uh, the stage here. Um, we have uh, Professor Brad Randleman, I think. Uh, it's almost useless to present uh, you, Brad. You are so well known in the world. Uh, one of the uh, greatest men in refractive surgery, uh, we all know the Randleman criteria. We all use the Randleman criteria in our uh, practice. Uh, today, uh, Brad is uh, working at the Cleveland Clinic, which is a very special uh, place for me and also for Marconi. Uh, so we are very happy to uh, have you here uh, and especially to learn a lot from uh, your talk. Um, and we have Marconi Santiago, Professor Marconi Santiago, uh, one of my closest friends. I will try to be as objective as I can, uh, but it will be tough. But still, Marconi is uh, uh, one of the greatest scientists in refractive surgery, uh, one of the smartest guys I've uh, ever met. Uh, you will enjoy his talk. Obviously, you heard probably many of his talk. Uh, this guy is super smart. Try to uh, catch his talk. It's good because it will be recorded, so you will be able to uh, uh, return on the uh, lecture. Marconi, you have 40 minutes. You don't have to speed. That will be fun for you now. <laughs> I gave you 40 minutes. I was so happy that I can give you 40 minutes for your talk. So this way you don't have to speed up uh, and to put your uh, 100 uh, uh, slide in uh, the four minutes of Astra. That will be fun. So on our side, from the Antaladasa Laser Institute. Uh, I'm very happy to have uh, with me Dr. Neil Sorkin. Dr. Neil Sorkin is uh, one of our uh, senior refractive surgeon, uh, very bright surgeon, uh, very research oriented, coming back from uh, Toronto where he finished uh, a clinical research fellowship there on cornea and refractive surgery. Uh, he's working today also and uh, he's responsible and head of the research uh, uh, for cornea and refractive uh, at the Tel Aviv Soraski Medical Center. And we're going to be very, very happy uh, to move forward with your talk. So, Brad, you can switch with your uh, okay. talk. Yeah, it sounds like we have the, uh, the Lake Erie Cornea Society here then, a refractive kind of. society. Definitely. <clears throat> All I right, can't well, tell you because I see the list here of uh, people participating. We have a lot of great refractive surgeons from Israel. So I can tell you those guys are not uh, connecting every time. I can tell you that uh, oh. your name were popping up like uh, the talk not to miss. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I would love, I'm, I'm, since there are a lot of people on, I can't see, but um, I would love to actually come visit instead of just giving a lecture in Israel one of these days. I know that it might be another 10 years before we can travel, but hopefully not so much. Um, yeah, and the 40 minutes is helpful. Marconi should probably be able to give both his introduction and his conclusion slides. So I think we'll be good there. <clears throat> I do have to admit that I have too many slides as well because obviously this is a topic near and dear to my heart. I will flip through a lot of images very quickly. I'll try to highlight the, the points. I also will have a lot of different literature slides in here. And again, I, in the interest of time, I'll keep moving, but hopefully you'll be able to see the references and if you wanna go back and, and look at things. And 
And I, I've titled this being aware of and being aware of the literature. And, and hopefully that will, will show up as I go. I do not have any financial interest, but Marcone, uh, BJ Dupes and I do have an atlas of corneal imaging coming out, hopefully the end of this year from Slack. A lot of the different images I'm showing are, are cases from there. So I'll start off with a couple of questions for you to, to hold on to as we go. Is, is this a good candidate for LASIK? Does this patient have a corneal ectasia? Does this patient? Which of these two eyes developed ectasia after LASIK? And which of these two eyes in a young patient with asymmetric keratoconus, which of these two eyes progressed to frank keratoconus? My mentor, friend, colleague, <clears throat> George Waring, uh, told me the basics of giving a lecture a long time ago. He said, tell your audience what you're going to tell them, and then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. And so I always try to follow George's mantra here. And so I'm going to start off with the end. Be aware of the literature. There are many, of a, there are many aspects of screening uh, that, sorry, I need to figure out how to minimize you all. I can't see my own, <laughs> ah, here we go, sorry. See my own slide there, <clears throat> excuse me. Many aspects of screening that have been known for a very long time. What is, sorry, I'm having technical difficulty here. You want to run your slide? I was trying to, but it won't advance. Are you clicking on the, try to see where is your mouse and click on the- Ah, there we go, got slide. it, sorry. <clears throat> it just, it's only running from my mouse now. Many aspects have been known for decades. There's a primary emphasis on anterior corneal curvature in screening. There's significant variability in subjective interpretations, but really that's due to a lack of accurate interpretation strategies in many instances. Beware of the literature. <clears throat> there are many metrics purported to simplify screening but they really uh, have very little evidence to support them. And, and many of these uh, metrics that are heavily used, unfortunately, don't work uh, nearly as well as, as they are reported to. And there's some accurate, uh, inaccurate information that continues to be reported and propagated. I will show some examples of this just to highlight this issue. So set yourself up for success with screening. Utilize the appropriate color steps and scales in your devices for image interpretation. Emphasize anterior curvature findings when you're screening for refractive surgery in your subjective analysis. And then combine that curvature with other data, elevation data, epithelial thickness mapping. I will say that uh, I will show quite a few examples of epithelial thickness patterns today. I do believe that that is a critical element for screening today. And combining technologies, still today, we do not have a single technology that gives us all the information that I think is critical for accurate screening. <clears throat> and then again, beware of poorly validated automated metrics. So be aware of the literature. And again, I'm going to go through some of this very quickly. Some of it is very old, but it's still quite handy. Big steps in ectasia risk recognition have included high risk anterior curvature patterns that we've known for 30 years recognition of additional risk factors beyond imaging. And I'm actually going to leave most of that to Marconi to speak to about because he has really done a bulk of the modern research on that. Scheinflug imaging. I, I sometimes uh, get a reputation for not liking Scheinflug imaging when nothing could be further from the truth. I use it routinely on all of my evaluations. And corneal epithelial mapping. And again, I think this is one of the most important things that has come out more recently in terms of being readily available. This is from 1989, uh, Rabinowitz and McDonald talked about the, the form Proust keratoconus pattern. The first studies by Seiler 
and colleagues showed ectasia cases in patients with form, what was called form fruce keratoconus. I don't know that that term has much utility, but a suspect cornea. <clears throat> we found that to be a major risk factor. In fact, the major risk factor in a study we did in 2003. We also reported looking at our cases and literature cases, the delay in diagnosis of ectasia. And I think that most practitioners understand this, but it's critical when you read papers, when a paper has a one year follow-up, understand that they're not going to catch more than 50% of the ectasia cases potentially in that population. Uh, we did come up with a, a risk score system. Uh, and again, I, I, I think that I use this more conceptually rather than directly today, but I will say that I, I do find most of these variables to still be important and most of these factors to still be uh, quite directly relevant. Again, a follow-up study a few years later and the same thing, <clears throat> where even at three years after we were only detecting three, uh, you know, 80 to 90% of the cases. So keep that in mind. When we think about corneal imaging, this is the way that I recommend going about the process. And so this is anterior corneal curvature that could be derived from Placido or Shine Fluke. The first thing to do is identify the color steps. I recommend 0.5 diopter color steps. The second thing is to identify the color scale. I recommend a fixed scale and I'll show you examples of these. At that point, look at the quality of the scan to see if you have artifacts, centration issues. And only at that point do you identify the curvature pattern and start to classify it mentally as normal, suspicious or abnormal. So color steps, so this is a, the same eye, the same exact scan shown in 1.5 diopter, one diopter, half diopter, and 0.25 diopter color steps. This is a placido image from an orb scan device, uh, but you can do this with any di different device. Original reports talked about using a 1.5 diopter color scale. I, I would argue that that is not sufficiently sensitive. Uh, I think you do much better at 0.5 diopters. This is a paper from 2013 where a variety of different individuals looked at uh, scans that the purpose uh, of the paper was slightly different uh, initially, but um, they initially sent out all the scans in 1.5 diopter color scales. And I, I requested that they send it back in, in 0 0.5. So this is an eye, when I show this at a meeting and I can see a, a show of hands, usually I get uh, you know 50% of the room to say this is mildly suspicious at the most. Whereas when you look at this scan in 0.5 diopter color scales, I think it becomes much more obvious the, the irregularity here. These are all of the eyes from this study shown in 1.5 and then 0.5 diopters. And again, sometimes it doesn't change the overall analysis, but sometimes it is remarkable at the detail that comes out. So you wanna give yourself the best opportunity to catch asymmetry. And that's really going to be accomplished if you use 0.5 diopter color steps. Color scales are slightly trickier. Every device that you have is going to show what the color scales are. This is a normative, they're fixed relative or normative and absolute scales. <clears throat> absolute scales are great in that the, the same color is always the same value. Uh, and I think absolute scales are fine. The downside is that there are so many colors represented that are really never shown physiologically in the low uh, teens to 20s and you know, 70, 80, and 90 that really don't have much value. I do like a fixed scale best over a certain range. The relative scale will change over time, depend or not over time, but based uh, per eye, depending on the relative steepening of that eye. So. This is an example of a patient seen over 10 years time, uh, the top image is 10 years prior. And, and I think on first glance, this looks bad. This looks like someone has steepened and worsened over time. But if you look, the first scan is a relative scale, the second one a fixed scale. And in reality, there's been no change at all in this patient. But those scales really don't give you that information. Because the patient's cornea is steep, in that relative scale, 47, 48 diopters is shown in light green, which is what we usually associate with a normal 
um, mid 40s, mid to low 40s uh, corneal steepening. Curvature patterns, I think we know most of the actual, uh, you know, keratoconic patterns or whatnot, but when we start looking at some of the more suspicious patterns, uh, there are some, the, the asymmetric bow tie with a skewed radial axis, uh, that is probably the most suspicious, uh, but some of these other patterns are, are quite important as well. But again, this has been known for a very long time, so don't ignore these things. This is a, an asymmetric bow tie pattern. It's starting to have the mildest of skew to it, but this is truly that abnormal pattern. So it has an asymmetric bow tie, but it also has a skewed radial axis. And that is an irregular pattern until proven, up, and in not only irregular, which it is, but it's an ectatic cornea or suspicious for that until proven otherwise. Against the rule patterns, can be totally normal. The right eye, I would argue, is, is quite symmetric. The left eye in this image, though, actually has a skewed pattern that you see over time. Again, a very extreme case and a mild case. The astigmatic direction is against the rule, but this would be the steep, uh, this would show the steep meridians if this were a symmetric cornea. In fact, this is a skewed radial axis, and that's the most important thing to be looking for in any of these patients, especially in refractive surgery, where we're going to be seeing younger patients and you will likely not run into that true pellucid type of pattern. Horizontally steep patterns are also harder to read. That appear, uh, these two images may look initially like a symmetric bow tie pattern with the rule. But if you actually look closer, you'll see that they're actually horizontally steep. And so you take this one pattern and you show all of the different shine fluke images and you can see that that the area where the cornea is steepest is also the area with maximal anterior and posterior elevation thinnest point a truncated bow tie is another pattern so whereas in a normal astigmatic pattern you should really see uh, the entire meridian with similar steepening in a truncated pattern it's going to be very focal again the image on the left you hopefully won't miss but that image on the right it should catch your attention as being a truncated bow tie and more concerning for pathology. And this is the same eye shown in Scheinflug. Sometimes it's a more dramatic bow tie than others. When thinking about corneal thickness measurements, I would consider ultrasound pachymetry to be uh, 1.0 version, Scheinflug imaging to be 2.0, and total thickness uh, to be incredibly important, regional thickness to be particularly important. But I would argue that we really need epithelial thickness mapping at this point in time. This has been known for quite some time. Dan Reinstein really did the pioneering work on this with very high frequency digital ultrasound. Uh, David Wong really did the work on uh, getting this to be available as an OCT device. And, and that's really what I have had experience with. We've We've been looking at this for many years and looking at the differences uh, between normal patients and patients with ectatic disease. Over time, you'll get a more focal thinning and then you'll get focal thinning combined with peripheral hypertrophy to try to normalize or uh, try to minimize the focal steepening that you'll get in an ectatic cornea. So this is a, this is a remodeling response in response to the primary driver, which is focal corneal steepening. So, this is that same eye. You can see it in the thickness, in the total thickness map in the middle. It doesn't jump out as you. It is a thin cornea, but nothing particularly irregular. But when you see that epithelial map, you can see how focally thin it is over that, uh, over that central cone. And again, this can be more subtle, but this type of finding is something concerning where you have that focal steepening with focal epithelial thinning. Uh, the epithelium has a remarkable capability of trying to remodel. You can see the curvature map and combined with the, the differential epithelial map there. Uh, OCT and very high frequency digital ultrasound give you very similar information. The OCT is much easier to use and much more ubiquitous. The likelihood is that you have an OCT device that you could use uh, to obtain epithelial thickness mapping. Uh, the Cirrus device in the United States does it. The OptiView devices um, outside the United States, there are likely others. And then the ARC scan is the very high frequency digital ultrasound uh, clinical unit. Uh, we did a review paper a few years ago on this. Uh, 
I'll put that back just a minute in case you wanted to see that citation, uh, just sort of covering this in general and some of the different uses. So how do we combine curvature and epithelial mapping? Again, uh, I'll show you a slide at the end where uh, I think you'll actually find that you'll rule in a reasonable number of patients as well. So you have in an eye, if there are no other findings other than a focal uh, steepening, but you have coincident hypertrophy of the epithelium, uh, some of those cases are ones that I find to be satisfactory for surgery. So this is another one with a, a mild or asymmetric bow tie, uh, but quite a bit of uh, inferior thickening of the epithelium. As compared to a patient with a relatively uh, low amount of focal steepening, but as an, an asymmetry combined with a thinner epithelial point. And so that's a concern to me. Uh, we see this sort of pseudo pellucid pattern sometimes. Uh, and again, uh, we found a reasonable number of these that are, are really primarily probably due to epithelial hypertrophy rather than true uh, ectatic disease. On the other hand, uh, these eyes tend to be thinnest in terms of the epithelium in the furthest periphery. So I, I would caution you, particularly with a pellucid type pattern, not to overread those, uh, but the information uh, is there. And again, when you see steepening in the curvature map combined with thinning in the epithelial map, that, that is a cause for concern. I couldn't find this actual physical paper, but this process of using epithelial mapping for screening was described over a decade ago by, uh, again, by Dan Reinstein, where they took patients that were suspects based on other devices and divided them into true suspects or not. And the patients they felt that were not non-keratoconic, they actually did LASIK on them and followed them. Uh, and and they, all those eyes did well. So identifying the pre cornea. This is a patient that I think highlights uh, the issues we have still to date. This was a 20 year old male who was diagnosed with keratoconus in the left eye three months prior to this visit. Best corrected acuity had reduced to 2030 in that eye, but uncorrected acuity was still 2020 in the right eye. And again, the left eye is clearly keratoconic. The question is this right eye. And so you have this pattern where the anterior curvature, both in Placido and in Scheinflug, shows focal inferior steepening with a skewed axis. None of the other maps, none of the elevation maps, the thickness map, any of the indices, both anterior or posterior surface indices, uh, none of these things really jump out at you. And even the epithelial map doesn't look particularly irregular in this eye. So the question is, does this patient have identifiable findings? If you didn't know the story, would you be able to identify that eye on, onto itself? Could you identify that eye as at risk if they presented for LASIK? Do they need cross-linking in that eye? Or do they have a true unilateral keratoconus, which has been purported to exist? How and where are ectatic changes first detectable? I, I'm not going to give you an answer at the moment, but I will say that, that I have some strong opinions and I will talk about this again at the end. It's important because the technologies we have are different in terms of what they do best and what they don't do well. If we need to find anterior curvature, then placido imaging and shine fluke imaging are the way to go. But placido won't give us anything on the posterior surface, for instance, if we need thickness, or if we need a variety of things, we need more than one imaging device. I'm going to come back to that patient a little bit later. Um, I'd like to spend a moment talking about uh, to beware of the literature and some of the things that are out there that really, uh, unfortunately, have not proved to be particularly useful or helpful. An overemphasis on machine-derived metrics. They're very attractive to use because they give you a number and the, many of them even give you a color-coded scale. An overemphasis on posterior cornea evaluations. An over-reliant on, over on current biomechanical measures, what we have and, and really what we don't. And then again, a, a misstep is forgetting what we've learned. So uh, is this patient a good LASIK candidate? Hopefully that doesn't take long to say no. But this patient unfortunately had LASIK in 2009 and not surprisingly developed ectasia. Uh, if you look at that pattern from 2009 to 20 years prior in the literature, it's nearly identical. I mean, that's, that's a patient that should have been excluded 
1989. Does this patient have keratoconus? This, someone asked me about this. Um, they had been told, no, they didn't have keratoconus because their corneas were too flat. That really has nothing to do with it. It is true that most patients with keratoconus ultimately have steeper corneas, but in reality, very many of them have asymmetric patterns and focal steepening. It's really the focality of the steepening rather than the overall steepening. Interestingly, I, I looked back at this study. This, many of you on the call are likely too young to even remember this, which hurts me a little bit, but it is the, it is the truth these days. But this paper received tremendous press when it came out because the concept was really that anyone could develop ectasia after LASIK, the low myopes without any risk. But in fact, if you look at this imaging, and again, the quality of this is not ideal, but this is, this is a patient shown in 1.5 diopter color steps. So the right eye has focal inferior steepening and the left eye has a skewed axis. So really even the sort of the prototypical image from this paper is abnormal and could have been caught if people had been a bit more attentive to it. Here's another case, the machine derived metric said that there was 0% uh, risk of keratoconus pattern. But when you look at the actual pattern, you can see the tremendous inferior asymmetry there. So this is, a, this is an against the rule pattern, but it really has a, a, promount, a pronounced skewed axis. And again, this is a patient who developed ectasia after LASIK. Does this patient have a corneal ectasia? Again, I think hopefully you would say yes, but when you look at some of the uh, the probability indexes here, they don't show up because the in, uh, far inferior steepening, the pellucid type of pattern is frequently missed. Another one where the numbers certainly don't jump out at you as being conclusive, despite the subjective evaluation of the maps being conclusive. Uh, this was a paper that looked at the Ectasia uh, system years ago and Again, the only thing I would highlight is that they had a one-year follow-up. They, they actually had the exact same sensitivity and specificity that we initially reported, but they only followed those patients for a year. And so many of the patients that they said might have been screened out, I would argue, probably were not identified. Uh, some other papers looking at age and looking at posterior corneal imaging, again, um, I can't speak to that those scans very well because unfortunately they're not high enough detail. Uh, another uh, paper that looked at the risk system, and again, this is a quite old paper, but they showed one, they only showed one individual uh, in their paper that had low risk. Uh, but if you look at this eye, it has three diopters of horizontal asymmetry in one eye and has skewed axis in another eye. So this is not a normal scan the issue here is not uh, whether or not the risk system works. The, the issue here is that this was reported to be a normal scan in both eyes. And in fact, this is a completely abnormal scan. The global consensus paper uh, that came out in 2015, I, I and many of my colleagues, including Marconi, had some, some real issues with some of the definition and diagnosis section. And the agreements that have been reached and, and that you'll see in many meetings, the following are, are mandatory to diagnose keratoconus, an abnormal posterior elevation, abnormal thickness distribution, and that posterior corneal elevation abnormalities must be present to diagnose earlier subclinical keratoconus. Now, the first thing that means is if you don't have a device that measures posterior corneal elevation, you really can't diagnose earlier subclinical keratoconus. But let's put this to the test. So again, this is the, all of that information from that paper would be included on this, uh, on, on the enhanced ectasia. But in 2014, Bay and colleagues looked at a, a population that they described as unilateral keratoconus, anterior curvature metrics and topometric indices were the only thing that differentiated the normal versus the fellow eyes. And actually none of the uh, enhanced metrics had any differentiation. Another paper by a different group in 2014 showed the overlap between the normal and the suspect eyes to be so pronounced that it was very limit, had very limited utility. I'm gonna very briefly show three papers here where we looked at the uninvolved, clinically uninvolved eye of patients with highly asymmetric disease. The first paper we used, Scheinflug imaging from the Pentacam and 
uh, combine that with epithelial mapping and total thickness from the OCT. So these patients, we had two devices. We first found that the OCT performed better by itself slightly than the shine fluke by itself, that both of the devices combined uh, performed much better, but no posterior corneal metrics, no enhanced, enhanced ectasia screening metrics were part of the system, part of the ability to differentiate these. We did a similar study on different eyes with the dual shine flug, uh, placido device, the Galilei. Uh, Oren Golan worked with me uh, and David is also on this paper as you see here. And when we look at these metrics, thickness, 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 and anterior curvature were by far and away the most important. Now, the posterior asphericity asymmetry index was useful in this population, in this device, but less so than curvat anterior curvature and thickness. And then another study, uh, Dr. Golan really drove this one with the Sirius device. Again, no, uh, no elevation metrics. There were some, uh, the, the IS value on the back surface, uh, but no elevations with that one. So if we look back at these things that must be present, let's look at our unilateral keratoconus case again. So is this really unilateral keratoconus? This is the enhanced ectasia screen from that eye, no abnormalities whatsoever. And in fact, over six months or so, this patient remained completely stable. However, they left for college, they came back in a year and they had progressed. This is exactly the eye that we'd like to be able to identify before they develop loss of vision. And the only thing that was demonstrably present in this eye was anterior curvature abnormality. Which of these two eyes developed ectasia after LASIK? Both of them did. Here is a paper from 2014. Again, this is a review paper, but just to show the imaging. So this is described as a completely normal anterior surface curvature and elevation, but it's reported in half diopter relative scale. So remember we talked about fixed versus relative. This is a scale that does not show much detail. So when you have a four diopter difference between 41.5 and 45.6 right next to each other. This color scale really doesn't show that. I would argue that's not a good color scale to use. <clears throat> this is another publication from 2014 calling that a normal preoperative topography. It's not, that's not a normal topography. There have been a variety of different cases reported uh, with ectasia after smile recently uh, and all of these are reported as having minimal signs of risk. Um, but when you look at these, you can see that all of these patients have abnormal anterior curvature. <clears throat> the point is not simply to drive home that, ab that there's abnormal anterior curvature, but don't just take the author's word when they say that it was a normal cornea without asymmetry, because all of these are clearly abnormal in that regard. <clears throat> is this case patient a good LASIK candidate? I showed you at the beginning. <clears throat> Excuse me, just show, focusing on the right eye here and the left eye. So these are the uh, four map refractive view for the shine fluke device. Uh, this is the enhanced ectasia for right eye and left eye. This patient developed ectasia after LASIK in the right eye. So knowing that, I think you can see some focal steepening in that anterior and axial curvature map on the top. There's nothing of any real significance in the thickness map, in the posterior elevation map, in the tangential curvature map, that focal steepening is really highlighted. And I will say that I do like tangential curvature when possible. The asymmetry indices, the anterior curvature asymmetry indices were also abnormal. I do think that these are useful. I do not think that they should be used directly for, uh, in isolation for screening, but I do think they can be quite helpful. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip over this in the interest of time here. Another patient, which map to believe? Now I've told you that the anterior curvature I think is, is more relevant and that 
Uh, I don't think that very often it occurs where you'll see an irregular post tier map. And now I'm going to completely contradict myself. So 35 year old minus four almost in both eyes, a little thinner cornea. These are the anterior curvature maps. I would argue those look pretty normal. This is the right eye. Now you can see some focal anterior elevation and the focal posterior elevation and a little focal thinning that is not directly centered in both eyes. Uh, the enhanced ectasia screening shows up as irregular in both eyes here. So what is going on here? How about this map and this map? Do those look more irregular to you? Well, what am I doing? This is the relative curvature map I've shown you. This is the fixed curvature map. And these are placido images in the upper left corner from the exact same eye the exact same day. So this is what this pattern looks like in relative curvature, in fixed curvature, and in placido imaging. Another paper, and this was just published this year, 2021. Same kind of case where it's a normal anterior curvature, but an abnormal or irregular posterior curvature. Except it's not. Again, relative curvature, there is a two diopter difference from of, of inferior steepening in this eye. This is an abnormal anterior curvature. It's simply shown in a scale that is not, not sensitive to show it. So I'd like to take the last few minutes here to go over a few cases and show you how we're screening today. And then hopefully one quick snippet on one paper uh, that's not in press yet, but, but will be soon. So a 25 year old male, minus three and a half in both eyes, a normal exam. This is the shine flu image of the right eye and the left eye. So you see a little focal steepening there on anterior curvature right eye, left eye, and the epithelial maps, which show coincident epithelial thickening. So this is a patient that I ruled in for surgery. The inferior steepening could concern me, but it was an isolated finding, and it is coincident with epithelial hypertrophy. Another 32-year-old female, again, minus three in both eyes, normal exam, same kind of focal uh, steepening a little bit more uh, uh, inferiorly displaced in the left eye. Uh, both, uh, again, the, uh, some of these metrics were a little higher, but still didn't read as abnormal in this eye. This patient had coincident epithelial thinning. So in this patient, I ruled them out for surgery. Uh, another case with a little mild inferior steepening in both eyes without any real findings in any other map and a fairly pronounced epithelial hypertrophy focally in that eye. A mild, uh, a mild skew in the curvature map, but really, uh, well, and so uh, in this left eye particularly, there's a little bit of a, of a skew sort of uh, nasal, superior nasally that has the elevation maps anteriorly and posteriorly also going in that same direction. Again, nothing of any major uh, interest on the other maps, but with focal epithelial thinning. And so again, this is a patient I, I ruled out in my clinic. I'm gonna skip that in the interest of time because I wanna show, oh, no, I'm in the right spot, sorry. Again, a 35 year old, three and a half to 375 in both eyes. These are different maps. This is the holiday report, but it does have axial curvature and tangential curvature. It has total corneal thickness and has anterior and posterior elevations uh, shown in a slightly different reference shape. <clears throat> this eye has a truncated bow tie as seen with, with some inferior steepening on axial curvature that is much more pronounced on the tangential map and really a truncated bow tie in the left eye, but no findings on the thickness map, no finding on the elevations. And again, when we look at the enhanced ectasia maps, these look totally normal and fine. And this patient developed ectasia after LASIK. Now I don't have uh, epithelial maps for this patient. For me, if I don't have epithelial maps, I will not assume normality 
Um, again, in my own screening, I, I always have epithelial maps these days. And then finally, a 37-year-old low myope, uh, very flat cornea. This is a very non-steep cornea. Um, and I would guess that that's part of the reason why this didn't catch anyone's eye. <clears throat> but you can see that sort of early pellucid type of pattern in the right and the left eye. And you can see that there is coincident anterior elevation, uh, a thinner cornea in both eyes, a slightly displaced thinnest point in the left eye. Uh, but again, the, uh, the enhanced ictasia maps look totally normal. This patient also developed ictasia after LASIK. Now, again, I don't use any specific numeric values on the asymmetries, but I do find them to be helpful sometimes. This is an eye that would have been caught using an anterior screening process or an anterior screening first process that was not caught using a posterior screening first process. Uh, this one I am going to skip in the interest of time. So we have a, a study that we've looked at very recently. Uh, we're just completing data analysis. Um, our research fellow, Laura Srawi, uh, won best paper of session. That's the good part. Uh, she didn't have a lot of competition, but we're not going to say that out loud. So anyway, I do think uh, personally the paper was pretty good. We're looking at this from a completely subjective analysis. So we wanted to see how epithelial thickness maps impacted our clinical decision. So uh, BJ Dupes and I reviewed 100 consecutive patients, but completely masked. And we looked at everything first, including the Scheinflug image. And then we went back and had the epithelial maps available to us to see how those maps impacted our decision process. Screening patients in versus screening them out changing the preferred surgery. And in eyes that did not change, did it uh, improve or weaken uh, our comfort level? So we found about 15% of our evaluations, uh, the decision was changed. So 15 out of 100, we changed the decision about surgery. Now, two to one, we screen patients in for surgery. So that's actually a good thing. I, I think people are concerned that if they add epithelial thickness mapping, they're going to screen more patients out. And in fact, we've found just the opposite. We've screened more in than we've screened out. Among the patients who were candidates, 20% of them, we changed the procedure offered, sometimes changing uh, toward PRK, sometimes changing away from PRK if we found uh, a, a more favorable uh, corneal imaging uh, process when epithelial maps were included. And in 60% of the patients, uh, our confidence in our procedure selected was improved. And about 25%, it didn't change. And about 15%, uh, it actually gave us sort of mixed messages. And we felt like uh, we were less uh, secure in what we had chosen. But I, I found this to be an, an interesting, and again, this is a completely subjective analysis. Interestingly, we did it completely separate from one another. Uh, and as you'll see, whenever the paper comes out, our responses were, were quite, quite similar in terms of how often we change decisions and whatnot. So coming back to the end here and the take home points, be aware of the literature. There are many aspects of screening that have been known for decades. Do not ignore what we've already learned because of new information that may be available. Um, I would argue wholeheartedly that the literature today supports an anterior curvature first screening approach for refractive surgery screening but not in isolation, just as a first approach. Beware of the literature. Most metrics purported to simplify screening today do not really perform adequately. And if you rely primarily on metrics, you will be let down. There's a positive evidence to support many of these claims. And in fact, many of the claims are actually refuted by the literature. Set yourself up for success. Utilize the appropriate color steps and scales for image interpretation. Emphasize anterior curvature in your analysis. Utilize epithelial mapping routinely, I would argue, and combine these findings with other data, especially elevation data and regional corneal thickness. I think all of that is incredibly useful. Don't limit yourself to what you're using, but I would use that as the rank order. So thank you for your attention.
Brad, thanks a lot. That was fantastic talk, uh, as usual. Uh, I think we've learned a lot. There was a, were a lot of uh, very important information for screening here. Uh, so let me ask first the audience, if someone wants to ask a question, first feel free to uh, write in the chat and then we will uh, ask the question. Uh, Nir, I think you had the first question for Brad, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you a question um, regarding epithelial mapping. Do you find it as a as an adjunct imaging uh, modality, or would you do an epi imaging on all your patients? And what happened if, for example, you have a totally normal shine flug imaging? However, the epi mapping shows you like focal thinning somewhere. How would you approach that? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I, I would say that I do. Um, so, so two different answers there, I guess, for the first part. I do find it adjunctive. Uh, that said, I don't know when I'm going to need it until I need it. And so we do get it routinely on everyone. It's just an easier process uh, for the flow. I will say that if you're, you know, obviously all of your imaging should be done prior to any drops or any other aspect of your examination. But between shine flug imaging and epithelial mapping, epithelial mapping is even more sensitive to any disruptions in the tear film. So it's really not something that you would want to go through your whole evaluation and then decide you want it to have. Uh, so we've just made it a part of our routine evaluation process. It really doesn't add that much uh, to it. Uh, perfect question. What, what do you do with a totally normal one uh, where there is an epithelial uh, thinning process. That, those are the 15 to 20% of the eyes where we felt a little bit less uh, secure about our decision. Uh, I would still, uh, I still utilize it adjunctively in that I don't believe that the epithelial thinning is going to be the very first finding. So if, if I don't see it correlated to something specific uh, on the anterior surface, I'm less likely to make a, a decision based solely on that. I will say, though, that it does make me go back and look at it again and see if maybe there was some subtle asymmetry that I just missed the first time around. Thank you. So, Brad, I do have a couple of uh, questions. We have another 10 minutes, and um, I have actually another uh, list of questions for you. Yeah. First, I'm just shocked that I made it in time. So I'm, I'm this is yeah, all. That was great. Time. You did a little less than the three hours that you wrote to me. That's right. <laughs> That's <laughs> Well, I did skip a few, but then we made it, so. <laughs> so, uh, first, you are writing a 0.5 diopter scale, okay? That's what you are using. Yes. Now, can you give some insight about the, the type of uh, curvature maps you are using, axial versus uh, tangential? Because sometimes when you use 0.5 in, uh, I like to use tangential, uh, many times for uh, looking at the periphery of the cornea, yeah. sometimes I'm feeling that 0.5 with tangential might raise some uh, noise there. Uh, yes. And I like to look at the astigmatism pattern with the axial map more. So wh yeah. what is your uh, expertise there? Yeah, so, so I will say that we, uh, we do use the axial map as the, as the baseline. And I agree with you. I think that you know, the, the benefit and the downside of the tangential map is the noise that you will see there. Um, if you're using a tangential map primarily, then you, you may want to look at a different color scale. Um, the, you know, again, in the United States, the Pentacam is the primary shine flug device out there. Um, and the, uh, at least the overview, a couple of the overview maps only show axial curvature. Uh, and so that's where I have defaulted to do as my baseline. I usually look at tangential curvature adjunctively on certain cases. Um, and then, you know, by the time I'm doing that, I'm generally at the machine itself. And so I'm going to toggle between uh, different things. But uh, I, again, if you're going to use tangential as your primary, you may find that uh, anywhere between a half and one is going to be your right, your right spot. But for axial maps, I would say that you need half diopter. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, now, the, the million dollar question is always when you have, uh, I remember Kruger asked me to, to give a lecture once as 
LASIK versus Puricane suspect cornea is a horrible question. Uh, <laughs> now, today we can ask also we smile, but if you have yeah. that type of weird pattern on the entire uh, cornea, a little asymmetry, uh, but when you look with placido, sometimes you are not sure to have some dry eye artifact or if it right. can really be uh, related to uh, really a symmetry cornea. Um, and obviously, if you have uh, someone with 20 years old or someone with 40 years old, it's another right. uh, type of question. But what is usually your kind of decision tree uh, management when you are with someone that wants to have a uh, refractive surgery and has right. this type of tricky cornea? Yeah, so I think the, the, the first two pieces of that are, are fundamental that, you know, in our hands, and, and we've, you know, we've analyzed our own data. So in our hands, our PRK outcomes long term really are, are identical to our LASIK outcomes. That, that's the first thing, because you do need to make sure that you're offering patients the best refractive outcome. Um, and as long as you're generating similar refractive outcomes, then I think PRK is a lot easier to offer in someone who has a su suspicious cornea. The second piece to that is whether or not there's a true biomechanical difference between LASIK and PRK. I would say that the anecdotal evidence today, it, despite being anecdotal, is quite strong that there is a difference. Um, if you think about that for the past, let's be conservative and say for 10 years, the vast majority of surgeons offer LASIK where they can and PRK when they are concerned. So we have been submitting the more concerning eyes for a decade to PRK and the number of ectasia cases after PRK is exceptionally low. So I do think there's a difference biomechanically and I do think that long-term the outcomes are the same. Therefore, for us, we are, if we do see things that are suspicious but not clearly abnormal, we do tend to default to offering PRK. The evidence on where smile falls in, I think, is, is quite mixed, um, you know, and uh, there's, there's good evidence that in, in the ectatic cornea, the problem is really in the anterior third of the cornea. The potential benefit biomechanically for smile is by maintaining that anterior third of the cornea. But if that's the worst part of your cornea, then that probably is worse than ablating that with PRK. Um, for us right now, uh, us, I mean, BJ and myself, we are generally not making a, a smile decision based on biomechanics. Uh, we, we're considering smile and LASIK to essentially be equivalent. I think there's a decent chance that they will be slightly different as we get more data. But I, I think that uh, SMILE is not anywhere close to PRK still today biomechanically. So, so that's kind of how we're going about the process. So, Marconi, if you want, you can also answer the question is also uh, for you, but uh, would you have any kind of, uh, uh, I'm related to your, uh, uh, to the Randleman score. Uh, and and what Marconi is gonna talk about with the the new ectasia uh, uh, system he developed? Uh, where are you putting here the influence of age? Let's say you have someone with a, a tricky cornea, uh, but still with relatively normal thickness uh, metrics, and you have the same uh, topography in someone that is. 21 years old with uh, minus five, but someone uh, with uh, 38 years old with minus two. So there are, there are here also two other uh, kind of biomechanical related metrics because it's age and, uh, and level of myopia that can influence your outcomes. Sometimes you said, well, if it's young and high myopia and uh, tricky cornea, I'm not going there in, in any uh, type of... Uh, surgery but sometime if you have someone that is a little bit older and, uh, and the myopia is kind of low and you will have kind of a 30 40 micron ablation you might feel more comfortable with pure okay doing that so what is your kind of cutoff point here uh, in that type of uh, situation yeah well i mean first I, I love your question because you know this is the main thing about 
uh, we are we are actually investigating now. You know, uh, I'm not sure we we do need a cutoff. And that's the that's the one of the main points. The second point is that you know previous studies have already identified um, age as a risk factor for ectasia. Dr. Random has done a fantastic job, and 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 it's it seems intuitive that age, of course, is very very important. However. Uh, historically, there has always been difficulty in, I would say, transforming this variable into something uh, applicable. Uh, what one great thing we did in our most recent studies, we see that the aging years, David, is not uh, relevant, for example, in the artificial intelligence modeling, and uh, as opposed to its influence. Uh, as a, another type of way of seeing age. I mean, age is still relevant, ju just not measured in years. Our theory is that the, the separation between patients expressed by the difference in years does not identify this real difference. For example, between a 20, a 20 year old and a 30 year old patient, there's not only a 10 points difference. You know what I mean? Uh, on the other hand, what we showed is that the, what we call age-weighted value, we called it uh, AWV, uh, just to make it a little bit easier to understand, which is a weighted, weighted way to measure age, proved it to be uh, one of the most important in the AI model uh, in better separating patients with, at, that, are, that are at higher uh, risk for for ectasia. You know, uh, another very important point is uh, you you ask. Uh, I'm going to show you at the end of my presentation my flow chart and how I, I handle those patients. And I think it's going to be easier to to see when you when you look at the flow chart. But you know, something very very important. Sometimes sometimes we kind of forget this is that you know taking chances or accepting risk is not something that the device will tell us. This is something actually from inside out. You know, it's something that how much risk we are able to accept for the, for that patient at that moment. Maybe we will change in the morning, in the in the afternoon of the same day. You know, so uh, what the devices are trying to do is to help you in making that that the decision. And in I would like to add a little bit to what uh, Dr. Randman brilliantly showed earlier and. Uh, 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 also trying to answer Dr. Sorokin's uh, question about when to use epithelium thickness or epithelium map. I would say that, you know, that map, you only, that map or any other shine flu derived metric, you only add to what the corner topography has shown, you know? So this is kind of what Dr. Randman was trying to say. And to me, this is very, very important because sometimes what people are doing at this uh, stage in refractive surgery is like the opposite way, you know. They what they what they they are trying to do is that any normal metric we will quit an a, a obvious abnormal topography. So that's that's that is a big mistake in, in my opinion. Uh, so that's why they have a very low sensitivity, and, and I mean one of the reasons why we have to take to look at those very carefully. And other an, another question that I would like to add a little bit before I start my presentation is David's question about uh, axial and tangential and 0 0.5 scale and whatever. You know, the, that's, that's, one of, that's another very important point because we cannot try to apply the same abnormal patterns we have learned for years. Those patterns are actually related to axial maps. Yep. If you try to, to apply that to tangential maps, you're gonna be very confused. And another very important point I like to stress mm -hmm. about that Dr. Renneman mentioned is 0 0.5 fixed scale. If you use a, a relative scale, I mean, you got again, you train, you, you have been training on watching on, 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 on seeing an image that is 0 0.5 fixed scale. If you look at, at the same scale, but relative, you know, all the training you have in your mind is gonna be gone, you know? So it doesn't really mean anything. So you have to use the same scale mm -hmm. that you train on. To, 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 to make any sense of, of, of imaging. And this is another part of our study. You know, we are gonna come out with something that will help everyone to, to understand the patterns either, a little bit easier with the Daniela Araujo, who's helping me in this whole AI uh, um, uh, project. So, I mean, I think it's, 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 it's very important to understand that, you know, how much we accept uh, from a risk factor or from a, a, 
any disease metric, any screening metric that are derived from chamfer, dual chamfer, or, or OCT, it, depend, it depends on how much we uh, understand that patient can tolerate. And you ask about PRK and LASIK, I mean, any tissue removal will put that patient on higher risk, you know? So of course, the more abnormal the topography or the meaning, the more abnormal the eye, you know, less tissue this patient uh, can tolerate being, you know, uh, removed or subtracted. So, I mean, this is something that we have to have in mind. So, and the decision will all be ours. Now, not that, not, not the, the, the machine will never make the decision for us, you know, so. Thanks, Makona, that's a great point. Um, I think right before we start, I think we have a question from uh, one of uh, uh, an optometrist here, a great optometrist understanding very well this technology here, asking about um, the OptoView OCT that you are using. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> We, we did have some experience with the OCT uh, and the difference of about 15 to 20 micron difference in thickness between mm -hmm. our Galilee maps and the OCT. Right. Now, uh, I'm always using the PTA for, for uh, mm -hmm. uh, planning my LASIK surgery. And that, that's, that makes some difference to have 20 micron difference. So Absolutely. what do you think about this, uh, those, this huge difference between the two technologies because the CT it's, a, it's supposed to be a very reliable one. Well, yes. So the, the, the short answer of that is I would use the, uh, the shine flu uh, still to date. We don't know what real corneal thickness is because you cannot measure true corneal thickness histologically. So we don't have any tissue based gold standard. <clears throat> most of the numbers and the metrics that were that have been around for a long time were actually based on ultrasound, which tends to measure a little bit thicker than shine flug. Um, so I, I think this is one of those cases where it's more important uh, what the system developed was based on rather than what the actual true number is. I mean, for instance, it, it might be that OCT is exactly correct and the true residual stromal bed that we can use is 200. Well, that's that's fine. That it doesn't really matter. But all of the and all the information that we have to date has really been based on measurements that tend to be a little thicker than OCT. So all I'm looking for is to make sure that those two seem to relate in terms of, you know, again, 15 to 20 microns. If I see 60 to 80 microns different, then one of them measured incorrectly, and that's going to make me look at them again. Um, for the total thickness maps, I want to see that they're analogous. Uh, the last thing I'll just say before I sign off my slides is my email is at the bottom here. I'm happy to answer people's questions or cases or whatnot. So please don't be shy if you, if you in the audience have a question at any time. Thanks a lot. Uh, Brad, thank you for this uh, fantastic talk. And I'm sure you're going to have uh, some... Uh, Email soon. <laughs> Perfect. All right, Marconi, you can uh, uh, switch with your presentation. Sure. I'm gonna share my screen here. I'm not, I'm not sure. Can you guys? Can you guys see my screen? Uh, yes. Now we can. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Let me just. Okay. All right. So. These are my financial disclosures. Uh, none is really related to the presentation today, although I'm going to show you guys a screen. I don't have anything related to that in terms of financial. So I'd like to, before I start, I'd like to thank, you know, Dr. Uh, Sorkin for the invitation and Dr. Smaja, who to me is a, one of my closest friends. He's a really like a, a brother to me and this, his whole his whole family. It's very special to be in a in a in this conference, although virtual virtual conference uh, that is organized by him because he's really 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 like a, a younger brother to me. So thank you thank you very much, David. Thank you very much for for inviting inviting me and and I'm gonna try to speak in in 40 minutes. I promise. 
<laughs> so before I start, I'd like to invite you all, you know, to the course that we organize in Rio. I hope we'll be able to have it uh, in person next year. It's going to be between uh, 23rd and 27th of March. And the whole course is translated into English and Spanish. We have more than 30 wet labs. And uh, now we have also more than 100 presentations and more than 30 uh, highly elaborated wet labs. So you can learn everything in theory and also in practical. We also have now small groups for hands-on training. Uh, we just had uh, two of this course this year and we're gonna have two more next year. So anything you need to know about this course there in our website, coursohefrativahilp.com. Dr. Renman, Dr. Smaja will give me the honor to, to uh, have, have their presentations. So uh, I'm going to start speaking, uh, you know, before I really go to the point that I'm going to speak today, which is the new model, you know, related to AI and all that, uh, I need to have a little background, you know, just to make sure you guys uh, and I are on the same page. You know, a couple of years ago, Dr. Dupes and I published this editorial about uh, structural relationships in post-refractive surgery ectasia, what we have learned. And I would like to stress about the, the fifth point here, difference between assessing risk factor and disease screening performance, because uh, this is very important to understand. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to divide this presentation today into this, uh, what we are talking about when you talk about risk factors and what we're talking about when we talk about screening methods. And I think Dr. Renan covered most of that very well. I'm going to just briefly mention, uh, but I'm, so I'm going to start talking about uh, a risk factor, and it's very important to understand that uh, a risk factor in, in this particular case here uh, is are most of the risk factors are related to the impact we have on the surgery. I mean, as a as a as a surgeon, when we when we plan. Uh, and the surgery, we have to understand the impact you have on this on this cornea. And, and when this patient develops ectasia, uh, this patient is not developing a disease. So it's methodologically impossible. It's really impossible. The word is impossible to test sensitivity or specificity of a risk factor for something that is not a disease. We are not trying to find out a patient who have who has a, a, a early signs of a disease here. So there's no room for, for sensitivity in terms of PTA, residual stromal bed, uh, and, and things like that. So when you heard about it, uh, people uh, talking about sensitivity of a metric like PTA, again, considering we are talking about a normal patient, a patient with uh, bilateral normal topography, uh, at best, it's a serious methodological error. And at worst, it's intellectual dishonest, to be very honest with you. So uh, going back to the risk factor we are going to talk about today, I need to go back to the one of the most, if not the most cited paper in June of refractive surgery. And uh, Dr. Randman didn't mention, but I have to, uh, June of refractive surgery is, is now this, the, the, the June of the highest impact factor uh, in, in, among the, the, the journals who are specific journals, not comparing to journals that are like uh, general, like ophthalmology and all that, but this is something very important to us. So uh, this is probably the most cited paper in, in this history of, of JRS, uh, which is the paper uh, published by Dr. Seiler and trying to, you know, uh, highlight and put some eyes on ectasia after LASIK. This paper was published in 1998, and I'm sure everybody remembers uh, those, those that paper. And that paper actually has a sentence, you know, based on biomechanical, um, sorry, based on biomechanical considerations, we recommend a residual corneal thickness of the stromal bed of at least 250 microns. This is very important because it's written there and obviously, I mean, if you go back and see 250 microns would mean different change, different alterations, different combinations of flap and ablation. Uh, if we have that same limit, that same cut off uh, for the same patient. But a specific part of this patient that everybody forgets, I don't, I'm, I'm not going back. I know I have a presentation where I go in detail back to that paper. Actually, it's a paper based on three case reports, but I'm not going, uh, specifically back on that, but there is one sentence on, on that paper that is in that paper that is very important to mention here. Uh, he does 
or they do state that they recommend a residual corneal thickness of the stromal bed of at least 250 microns, but they say, assuming the biomechanical parameters are constant throughout corneal thickness, which we know it's not true. As corneal tensile strength is not uniform throughout the central cornea, with a progressive weakening, the posterior two thirds, uh, the relative extent of biomechanical alteration expressed as death or expressed as uh, uh, percent tissue alter definitely uh, has a better representation of the change we are causing in that cornea. So this is very important because we people uh, magically just forgot about that. I mean, just forgot about that very important sentence to consider residual stromal bed that the author stated when they suggested that that corneal thickness. So that's that's a very important point, you know. So uh, we did propose this uh, percent tissue order a couple of years ago when I was still in Cleveland with David Smudge, my, my great friend there. And for LASIK, this is, is the combination of flat thickness plus the ablation depth divided by corneal thickness. And the, the thinnest corneal thickness you have available. And we, we started with two studies uh, where we investigated the role of PTA on the change in the biomechanical variables that we had. And we compared to other, other variables that we had available, corneal thickness, age, uh, ablation death, uh, you know, res and residual stromal bed. And PTA was the variable that correlated the most with this change in, 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 in corneal um, biomechanical metrics. And we didn't stop there. Uh, and this is very important. One very important thing, if, if not the most important thing, is that after that study where we investigated in, uh, normal eyes that had surgery for myopia, we specifically decided to investigate the potential role of PTA on, on ectasia. And what we found is first, the most important thing, we had to uh, only include eyes that had bilateral normal preoperatively preoperatively uh, bilateral normal topography uh, and to understand the impact of any risk factor it's very important to have eyes with normal topography uh, preoperatively to understand the role of any 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 risk factor so this is a very important point as, as dr randman just showed this is something really hard most of the studies that use the word the word the word normal in fact, they are actually considering completely abnormal topography patterns. I mean, with more than 1.5 uh, difference in the, in the inferior steepening. So this is just impossible to understand the impact of any risk factor if you do not group the right group of eyes. So we did that. And first we saw that the case that developed ectasia had on average a higher PTA, but of course that was not enough. enough. We did find a cutoff of 40% as the best combination for uh, and a very high odds ratio that did not include one uh, in the confidence interval. So by definition, we had a, a risk factor by definition. So in, 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 in being a risk factor mean your chances are higher if you, if you go after this point. And of course, as any cutoff point, we can have discussions and, and we'll, go, we'll go there in a couple of minutes. So and we if we compare the same eyes that did develop ectasia with, both, with bilateral normal topography and preoperatively, we can see that residual stromal bed is definitely not a good metric. I mean, we could miss lots, lots of eyes, you know, for instance, if you use uh, 250 microns or either if you use 300 microns, which is also a random number. Uh, it's very, you know, it's very interesting this because people are still in love with, with residual stromal bed, even though we do not have any studies, any, any case control studies like we did. We, so like I said before, first we've, we've, we showed uh, the impact of PTA on normal eyes after myopic ablation, normal eyes. Then we investigated the role on eyes with ectasia so we follow all these steps to, to understand the, the, the impact of this metric. And people are still in love with residual stromal bed that, that has no methodological background, no methodological um, studies to really support the, the importance of this. Of, this of course, uh, it will always be important because what is left is some, uh, somehow a representation of what we have changed. So of course, it, it's, it, it, it has its importance. I'm not... Um, 
removing all that, but it's just not the most important thing, it's just because it's an indirect measure of what we have changed. But again, for the same uh, residual stromal bed, we would have different change in different patients. So uh, a percent, a relative change is more representative of the real impact that the surgery uh, has caused in that patient than what is left, than, than, the, than the residual stromal bed. As we see here, if we look only at the eyes that did develop ectasia with normal topography, uh, residual stromal bed could have missed many, many patients. So again, these are the same eyes that would have high residual stromal bed considering uh, safe limits and a very high PTA and would have still developed ectasia. So again, the more abnormal, and we published about this too, uh, the lower are the PTA val values that, are, uh, that could be related to ectasia. So we have to have that in mind. Again, uh, Dr. Renman published this in January of 2008. It's a brilliant study that kind of group all the risk factors. And one of the, the findings that are very important from these studies is the contribution, contribution of corneal thickness and the contribution of myopia. But it's very important to understand that part of that contribution uh, is related to the indirect impact they have in the, in the, in the same equation that derived from, from which PTA is derived because uh, when we calculate PTA, we are also calculating, we are also using the ablation depth, which is the myopia, and in the denominator, we use the corneal thickness. So when we remove the topography from the equation, we can see that corneal thickness and myopia, uh, we have their importance decreases because they see they include one in the confidence interval. So they, they are not really a risk factor. Uh, and probably because when we look at a very thin cornea and a very uh, myopic eye, and they are really related to the risk of ectasia, somehow we will, if we look at the topography, we will see that they have even uh, subtle signs of, of focal steepening, of abnormalities. When we remove the topography from the equation, uh, both uh, corneal thickness and myopia, you have their, their importance really decreasing. Again, they are more important as part of the equation uh, that, that we would uh, generate PTA than isolated values. And if we, if we continue uh, looking the, at the literature, we can see that Dr. Dupes and, and Ibrahim Seven published recently uh, in their mathematical model that the PTA had a higher relation, a, a higher correlation with the change the strain change uh, after LASIK than residual stromal bed. So again, it's an indirect uh, uh, validation of our findings uh, because uh, again, both are very important, PTA and residual stromal bed, but, the, but PTA has a higher correlation with the, the change because it, it, it's more representative of the change we have. So it's a very important for it's very important for us to have this, this kind of um, validation, indirect validation of our, our findings. And we didn't stop there. If you look back in the literature uh, to those eyes that develop ectasia with truly normal topography, we can see that all the eyes in the literature uh, had the PTA higher or equal to 40%. And most are have this type of title, you know, delayed ectasia falling LASIK with no risk factor. Is a 300 microstromal bed enough? Of course not, because again, in this study is one more representation of eye that had a high PTA and within normal limits residual stromal bed. So we needed something that is more representative of the change. And this is what PTA is. We recently validated this in a study published in ophthalmology a couple months ago with the same cutoff. Again, a cutoff, it's always something we can discuss. Uh, you know, neither uh, residual stromal bed nor PTA nor any other uh, risk factors are, I would say, immune from from the from the weakness of having or suggesting a cutoff point. But we have to try to find a balance, you know, between the risks and and the benefits, and. If you look, and this is a, a very nice study because it has Dr. Serkin Chu, uh, David Smajan and I, and it's very important to see that uh, if you consider a patient 
uh, at higher risk for ectasia just because of PTA, you can go ahead and do refractive surgery. I'm not saying do not do refractive surgery. I'm just, I'm just saying this is a not good patient or a good candidate for LASIK, but you can go ahead and remove the flap thickness from the equation and, and do PRK. And in this study, we show that actually we can reduce more than 10 uh, percentage points and the results are great. I mean, uh, you, if you go ahead and do PRK with mitomycin C. So given the elective nature of this surgery, it seems logical that the balance of risk acceptance should be weighted towards uh, minimizing your risk. So that's what we would suggest at this point. Uh, again, if you are still in love with residual stromal bed, this is the calculation of the residual stromal bed that I would use, which is corner of thickness minus 0 0.4 times corner of thickness, which is a joke because this is the limit of PTA of 40%. But we didn't stop there. Like I said, I understand and recognize the limitations of having any, any cutoff for any, for any risk factor, any cutoff. Uh, is not an exclusive thing for PTA. Again, and like we have done over the last, last almost, I would say seven, eight years, we, we didn't stop uh, as people did with residual stromal bed. Uh, we didn't stop. We are still trying to find better ways of looking at this metric or at the impact of, uh, or the combination of risk factors for, for refractive surgery candidates. So we, uh, through the, the concept of uh, artificial intelligence. We, we follow just and, and help of Daniela Castro, who has helped me a lot in this whole uh, protocol. Uh, we, did, we, we went through two, two very important steps. One, which is called feature engineering. Uh, I, 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 I think I helped a lot in this, in this stage of this uh, protocol because we, with, this meta, with my mathematical background and her mathematical background, we could find some uh, another, I would say, uh, group of, of, of potential risk factors, potential variables that are actually generated, mathematically generated from the risk factors we, we have known so far. But two were very relevant to the model. And then we put everything in the model. And then we, the two that were relevant to the model were, were age-weighted value, which is another way to see age, but not in years, you know, uh, this is very, 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 very important. And another one that is called PTA derivative, which is, uh, I, I would say, a, 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 a more appremorated way to see the same variable PTA. And when we put in the model, the very nice thing here is that the machine learning approach for this modeling uh, does not uh, take uh, the cutoff point of, of any of the variables into account. They consider them all together and correlations between them that we are not able to actually see when we look at them uh, as isolated variables. So this is a very important thing. So the variables that the model highlighted as the most important ones were PTA derivative, PTA, age weighted value and measures of corner thickness. And with that, in, we, using that strategy, we're able to better and correctly classified patients uh, that would end up developing ectasia and patients that would, let's say, have a high PTA and would have been, would have been fine. And this is, a, I think this is one of the most important images uh, from this study, uh, where we can see uh, in yellow and red are eyes that did develop ectasia and red correctly predicted as high risk and yellow wrongly predict as low risk. So we, if we see residual stromal bed, we can, we can see that lots of yellow dots. With PTA, we still have some dots, not as many as with uh, other methods. But we, if we use the AI method, we are able to almost catch everyone with uh, also a good, uh, great capacity of differentiating the eyes that actually are good controls. So uh, with this method, we found out combinations, interactions between risk factors that we were not able to see. And again, without using any cutoff, any cutoff. So I think there are at least four advances uh, derived from this study. First, again, PTA had a stronger relationship with surgically induced chain than residual stromal bed. I mean, these this four advances are actually from all the studies we have done so far. Two variables uh, generated in the future engineering process enhanced the role of existing variables such as PTA derivative and age-weighted value. 
a no cutoff point method based on artificial intelligence is even better and neither residual stromal bed nor flap thickness played any significant role in separating patients in the machine learning process again this is uh, this is a contribution of many people for many years and we are still working on that when i i heard this question that i think uh, someone in the audience uh, just just did about using the the corneal thickness from the epithelium map from the OCT or, or, or the epithelium map no from, from the OCT excuse me or from the Scheinfeld device I would say well the the thinnest the better you know uh, but I think if you are using a dual Scheinfeld device you are, you are in a very good in a very good place like doc, Dr. Randman said we don't know the exactly although uh, uh, unless we had a histological, histological uh, uh, calculation, we, we actually don't know the exact uh, uh, corneal thickness. So I think if you if you're using uh, the, a dual shine flu or shine flu or an OCT, we are very in a very safe place, and it's very all the methods are very reliable. But as we have shown here, if you use the if you if you think about the PTA calculation, and let's see. Just as an example, a flap thickness of 110 and an ablation depth of 32 microns divided by 540, you're of course times 100 because it's a percentage. PTA would be 26.2%. Uh, but if you measure in the center and if you measure at the thinnest point, the lower the measure, of course, the higher the PTA will be. And on average, this difference would be 0.2% between when you measure the PTA using considering corner thickness in the central and considering the corner thickness in the thinnest point. And the maximum difference in normal eyes will be 1.2%, not percentage points, not higher than that. And if you have a difference uh, when you consider PTA in the central and PTA at the thinnest point that is equal to or higher than two percentage points, I would recommend you to look back at the topography because that's not normal. You would need at least 40 microns to, to reach that difference. So look back at, at your topography because it's probably not a normal eye and you are, it's probably something you have overlooked. So you should go back and look at that again. Uh, in the Galilee, we have this uh, map, the PTA report where you can, uh, the device will calculate it. And in, P in the Galilee, we have this PTA plus, which is uh, a, a something very close to what we call PTA derivative, but one, one, one step a little bit uh, behind. But it's something, it's something very important. Where, where in, the, in the PTA report, you can see the PTA at the central, PTA at the thinnest, the PTA plus, and the PTA curve. Uh, a couple of years ago, the academy has a, uh, the academy uh, recognized PTA as a risk factor for ectasia, which for us is something very important because, like you have showed you all, it's it's a consequence of years of work. We are not, you know, making. Uh, uh, any joke here we are working seriously in trying to find something that makes that makes our surgery a little bit safer for our patients uh, moving forward again we didn't stop there uh, part the other part of our study and i'm and and i talked to dr randomman before to make sure uh, our talks were not overlapping so i'm not going uh, through all the methods that are trying to, you know, uh, using metrics and identify any abnormality with tomography and topography. And I'm not, I'm not going there, but I'm going to quickly just show you, you know, um, it, it's very nice that David uh, kind of asked this question. And to me, these are the abnormal patterns uh, for topography that people uh, should uh, pay attention to. Uh, it's a little bit different than the patterns that, uh, 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 Rabinovitz described uh, more than 20 years ago. Uh, I think this is a little bit more updated, I would say. But again, the, 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 the hallmark of ectasia risk is asymmetry. And the higher the asymmetry, the worse it is. So I'm not going through all of this in details. I just wanted to highlight that quickly. 
But again, what we are trying to find out here, what we're trying to recognize here is early signs of corticonus. This is the main point. Normally, I, I try to avoid the word corticonus, but it doesn't really matter. The point is, uh, we are trying to find out eyes that deviate from normality, that have any abnormality in, 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 in their structure. So this is the main point. We are trying to find out eyes that have any abnormality in their structure. So to me, there are some steps and to me, it all starts with a genetic de de uh, mutation, a genetic defect, then altered metabolic reaction, then a structural change. And this is very important because David is leading another study very nicely uh, where, where we, are, we are trying to find structural change using nanoparticles in with uh, CHP. Then we will we will finally reach to the stage where we have change in strength and only then we'll have the imaging devices highlighting or revealing anything. So it's actually the last stage of Cartoconus. But uh, some of our studies has brought, uh, I would say, have, have brought uh, some, some light in this discussion showing, this is a paper that's going to be published very soon in JCRS, showing that eyes that have Cartoconus and are, they are progressing. We will present higher levels of interleukin six, and that and there's a correlation of interleukin six with thinning in in stroma and epithelium, and also eyes that are progressing have a higher cortisol concentration as well. This is a very important study. So we are trying to you know show. Uh, signs of abnormality before the, the change in imaging. And we didn't stop there as also um, some of the questions were addressing earlier. Uh, we are also using epithelium maps and I think Dr. Sirkin asked that and we are, all, we are getting epithelium map routinely for everyone, all the patients that are um, refractive surgery candidates. And, and, and the reason why we got is because we have literature enough showing that the epithelium matters. Probably, and I, I really believe that it always starts in the epithelium. And uh, how we, you, we measure that is another point. There's a very nice study uh, published in JRS that won the Troutman Award a couple of years ago showing uh, signs of apoptosis and P53 marker in, in epithelium, uh, epithelium layers of eyes that had corticonus and, and probably with uh, uh, impression cytology we'll be able to detect those eyes uh, very, very, in very, very early states. But the point is, uh, we do have some abnormalities in epithelium. And another study that we uh, are going to publish very soon is that we also found correlation between epithelium chains and interleukines, and also that the variation of epithelium, not only the epithelium measurement, not only the, the finest point of the epithelium, but more important than the finest point is the variation. You know, the variation between the minimum and the maximum point. We, we just showed that as they are progressing, and this paper will be published in, in ophthalmology also very soon, uh, present a, a, a significantly wider uh, difference between the minimum and the maximum measurement of epithelium, especially with nine millimeters wide maps, because that's also very important. And we show that that difference is also correlated with interleukin-6 and hair cortisol concentration. We divided in two studies because uh, for the corticonus and uh, stable versus progressions, it was a little bit easier to have a, a larger group of eyes. So we have one study that, uh, showing the eyes that are progressing presented a significantly higher or wider difference between minimum and max. And we have another study with, uh, uh, I would say a lower number of eyes because we need internal kind and hair coats of concentration is not very easy to get from many patients. So we have, a, uh, that's another study. Uh, we are going to submit that one very soon. But the main point here is that we also found two things. Again, the difference between minimum and max is a sign of progression, an earlier sign of progression, and it's also correlated to interleukin and to hair cortisol con concentration. 
This is just an illustration of an eye uh, with, I would say, uh, keratoconus and low case. And this is also very important because many people, when they are trying to investigate the role of interleukines or any other variable, they group patients uh, with, uh, in states and compare stage one with stage four, let's say, and they couldn't, they, they haven't been able to found to found to, to find out any difference in, in, in interleukines in those groups. And, and we believe the reason why they didn't find, and we did, is because instead of uh, comparing stage one and stage four, we have to understand and identify eyes that, that are actually progressing because you can have stage one or stage four, they are stable, and you can have stage one or stage four, they are actually actively progressing. And when we compare people that are actively progressing to people that are stable, we were able to find out a difference in ethereum uh, variations and also in interleukin-6 and hair cortisol concentration. As Dr. Randman uh, have already shown, Eptilium variable, eptilium variables were very important, uh, and and and, and it, we, this is when we use that in combination with anterior um, measurements of topography or interior measurements of asymmetry, topometric indexes on and all that seems to be the best combination of of variables we have uh, at this point. And to finish my presentation, again. Uh, we, 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 we understand those variables are very important, but we would miss something if we, would, if we use cutoff values for all of them. So what we are doing is try to get all variables from different devices, Galilei, Pentacan, OCT, uh, and put them all together, again, going through two stages, the first stage of feature engineering, and we develop many variables like we can see here. And then we develop a model. And with this model, we were able to have, and, and in this case, we can call sensitivity because we, because we are trying to identify early stages of a disease. We got 100% sensitivity here. Again, doing going through the same methods. And one thing I'd like to say about the, the first method, the method that use risk factors, we will make this method, that method available uh, probably in less than a month. It's gonna be totally free. You know, you just need to go to the website, put the values there, and the model will be calculate will calculate the risk uh, and and you'll be able to, to make a decision based on that. So to finish. I would say that all starts with topography. To me, all starts with axial topography with 0.5 fixed scale. So if topography is abnormal or normal is really the main, uh, I would say, uh, uh, axis I would have to follow here. So if topography is abnormal, then you can, Exmer laser to me is not an option. I mean, and, and you can go ahead and do fake IOL if you want to, but Exmer laser is definitely not an option. And what is abnormal? Like abnormal were those patterns that I, do, that I showed a little bit earlier. Again, uh, any focal sign of asymmetry is a sign of abnormality. The higher the values, the more abnormal that cornea is. But how much uh, is uh, considered abnormal to, let's say, uh, consider that not consider those, that patient for refractive is something that you have to be able to understand that uh, any abnormalities actually will put that patient at higher risk for, for ectasia. So we have to have that in your mind. But so the main point of discussion is when you have a suspicious pattern, just to put a number on that, although I don't like that much, but let's say if you have an inferior steepening that is uh, higher than one diopter between one and 1.5 and 1.4, that would put that patient in abnormal group, in the abnormal group. If it's between 0 0.5 and one, it depends on the, the K values. It could be abnormal or suspicious, could be either way. But you mean, let's say it has low Ks and you consider that patient's only suspicious. Then is when you get additional data. It's only at this stage that we will get additional data. And, adi and by additional data, I mean tomographic indexes and all that you want. So uh, they, will, they will never acquit an abnormal topography because if they are abnormal, easy. Exmer laser is not an option. 
If they are normal, then you have a decision to make. To me, I would still go ahead and, and, and I would not do I would not do surgery here. I would keep my my the same decision that I had made. But if you want, you can consider age. And if it's too young, you don't do surgery. If it's a mature corner, you go ahead and do PRK. Or something that sometimes I do is you can just uh, at, tell the patient, look, I'm not doing your surgery right now, but I'm going to follow you for a couple uh, um, of months. So you can follow the patient for a year. If it's normal, everything is too normal, you go ahead and do PRK. I would not consider LASIK, but it's a way to kind of structure your, your, your way of thinking and decision-making process. But when top orf is normal, is really when I'm happy. Now, so the smile face to me is really when I have corneal topography is really normal. And then I'll look at PTA. And I mean, a PTA, but, uh, you, you, uh, just, just to remember, flat thickness plus ablation depth divided by corneal thickness. If it's less than 40, I will go ahead and do LASIK. If it's higher or equal to 40, I'll do PRK. Now, uh, like I showed earlier, we can now also use the ectasia risk model based on artificial intelligence that will consider two new variables and sometimes eyes that, that I would have considered for PRK would go back to LASIK and some eyes that would have been considered for LASIK would go to PRK, but all starts with coronal topography. This is very important. Before I finish, I'd like to invite you all again for the course we have in Rio. Uh, like I said, more than 100 presentations, 50 international speakers, and more than 30 uh, highly elaborated uh, wet labs. So we are going to, to, to have a new book next year with some international co-editors. Uh, Dr. Brad Randman is going to be one of the co-editors. David Zmaj is going to be one of the co-editors too. And all you need to do is go ahead and, uh, and, and look at our website, cursoefativahill.com. Before I finish, uh, I'd like to say that I have many pictures with David Zmaja, but this is one of the nicest one in Tel Aviv. Like I said, David Zmaja is one of my, my closest friends. I really love this guy, but I made sure I have many pictures with David, so I, I want to make sure I had a picture with the future star in the family, which is Sherry. She's definitely, so, she's so cute and she's definitely uh, the one that I should show today and not David. So this is the picture I'm proud about. Thank you very much for your attention. If you guys have any question, just email me or reach out to me in my Instagram, which is Marconi Santiago, just like it's written here. Thank you very much for all your attention. Marconi, thanks a lot. That was fantastic talk. I think I even uh, wrote to you uh, while you were uh, uh, speaking. Fantastic slides. I love your talk, but this you know, but it's really fantastic slide. Crazy. Thank you. Man. So, um, especially the last one. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was, that was I, 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 for some reason, I, I, I kind of had this feeling that you would like that one. Man, she's so cute. And I, I, love I love you guys, so you know. That. So uh, I took picture, even though it's recorded, but I took picture of your decision tree. That, that's, a, that's a great decision tree. I think you have to publish that. Uh, I think that's what people are looking for also to get some uh, decision tree from the master. And, and this is very, very good slide. Uh, so um, a few questions. I think there are a few questions from the audience. I, after that, I have uh, also some uh, question. I see one here already in your Q&R from, uh, one of our residents actually. Uh, do you think there could be a role in the future of using integrating confocal microscopy for the measurement of uh, histological epithelial change that can link for the detection of keratoconus or other ectasia prior to refractive surgery? So this is a question for, uh, for you both guys. If you think there is a, a, a future by integrating confocal microscopy uh, and looking at the epithelial change uh, for keratoconus uh, screening. Yeah, I mean, David, you know, like I said before, I mean, I think there's a room for anything that is a reliable measurement of corneal, you know, 
thickness or epithelium thickness. Uh, I mean, the point is, which one is the most important one? I don't know. I mean, the, the, at this point, we have very reliable devices. You know, I don't think the point is measuring corneal thickness. I think it's, it, to be very honest, is the, the point now in terms of imaging, like I said, uh, which to me is only at the end stage of Kurtokonos, you know, like, like um, you know, we, we, we know. Uh, we are at uh, the point to me is how to combine all of them, you know, how to combine all this information, you know, and try to get uh, to states that are a little bit earlier than the imaging state. So I think that's that's the next frontier, you know, that's that's the main point. So, so what in, in these things, what do you guys think about this uh, new genetic test that you can do at the clinic, like a Velino thing? Yeah, I don't think that we have literature to say anything about this enough. Yeah, I, and, uh, I got some information from them recently. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that there's a very good. They don't. They don't have or are not showing uh, correlations between uh, you know patients who've developed ectasia. Uh, patients who have had progressive keratoconus or not. So uh, uh, unfortunately, I think that one might um, lead to as many false diagnoses currently as, uh, as it would help. Um, it, it doesn't really surprise me. I mean, if keratoconus genetics were easy, they, they would be better understood because people have been looking at that for at least 30 years. So it doesn't surprise me that it's not an easy test, but as opposed to the corneal dystrophies where those tests are, are quite useful, even in early stage clinically, uh, the keratoconus ones I think are, are, are still are a long ways away. So we had a, we had a question before that uh, regarding the, uh, both of your talk on the focus on the epithelial change. Uh, one of our, most experienced surgeon here uh, in the country uh, sent me a message and uh, asked me to tell, to ask you. Um, here, most of the center, they do not use uh, routinely epithelial uh, uh, map thickness. Uh, usually we see that in, uh, in university centers, uh, mostly for research. Uh, but they do not have that for a routine. Now, what would be your kind of uh, number one things to pick up uh, if they do not have that? And if you do think that it's really uh, should be a game changer in the, in the decision making for refractive surgery? Well, so based on our study, and again, it, far from perfect, but uh, we would have excluded more patients uh, based on that than we would, uh, without the epithelial mapping, we simply would not have offered surgery to 10% of the patients that we looked at. Um, and another, I don't, I don't know the, I haven't seen the final data yet, but I think that another 20% would have only been offered PRK. And I, and I don't, again, I don't mean that as a, as, as a lesser outcome, but certainly uh, in the United States, for instance, there are a handful of patients who are offered PRK who exclude themselves from surgery if they can't, uh, if they can't have a different type. Um, so th the first thing that I would say is, uh, you know, people originally, a lot of, you know, it, it sounds crazy, but 25 years ago, a lot of centers didn't have corneal topography to do refractive surgery. They did refraction and pachymetry. And we think that's insane today, but at, at, for a while there was a question on why you needed corneal topography. You got K values and thickness. Again, this is in the nineties. And then shine fluke imaging came out and a lot of people said, well, I, why do I need shine fluke imaging? And now I think, you know, the, the vast majority of refractive surgeons do use that. Um, so Epithelial thickness mapping, I think, is in that sort of phase now. Where people say, eh, I've been doing just fine. Um, but I would say that the likelihood is, if you get good information, the likelihood is you're going to screen in more patients than you screen out. 
um, ultimately you're probably going to do more surgery. And with the OCT devices, you can use those for other things, you know, whereas with your shine fluke imager, that's all you're going to get is corneal refractive imaging or keratoconus for the most part. Whereas this, you can do optic nerve head analysis. Uh, if you have a multi-specialty clinic, you can do, uh, you can look at the macula if you do lens-based surgery. So uh, the device I think will pay for itself in a fairly short period of time. Uh, yeah. You know, again, I, I get it. I get the resistance to adding things to the process. On the other hand, I would say this is very low hanging fruit. And, you know, I, I, I think it can really be advantageous and can quickly more than pay for itself. Yeah, I think well, your study um, will be very important. If I could add to that some, of course, I agree with everything. If I could add uh, quickly, I would say that uh, uh, the only thing about the corner, the, the, the epithelium thickness, thickness map, is that we, we, although we are expecting thinning uh, at the steepest area uh, that we saw in the topography, uh, we do not know exactly how much thick or thicker the, the epithelium measurement inferiorly uh, should be to actually have an impact on corneal topography to say that the inferior steepening is actually explained by that epithelium thickening uh, in the map. So uh, the only, to me right now, uh, we are also doing a study on that to try to address that specific concern. But to me right now, the epithelium map will only help me to actually rule, uh, to, to screen out uh, I'm still a little concerned to screen in patients based on the epithelial map, but but I think there's a there's a there's a trend I would say towards on that direction. I just I just want to you know um, help people to structure their thinking on that. And also the other point is that we would need methodologically speaking uh, a group a, a big group of eyes. I I, I know. Uh, Dan Rising has been very eloquent about this, but I, I still need some robust studies uh, where we have truly normal topography bilaterally with, uh, let's say, with this inferior steepening that is explained by epithelium thickening inferiorly that had surgery and are fine, followed by, like Dr. Renderman said, more than two years and stuff. So I mean I don't know maybe maybe that is a maybe that is a way uh, to help screening in patients but to answer your friend David uh, he can live very well with corneal topography man. that's the main the main point here you know so he doesn't need an epithelial map or an OCT to do a high level refractive surgery uh, that's 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 uh, that's that's I think the main message or otherwise people can think that they need an epithelial map right now to do refractive surgery and and I don't think that's the case but but it helps I mean it may help screening in patients but uh, I mean you can do a refractive surgery now without that so it's interesting because we haven't published the data yet but we have very similar uh, I don't remember the, the the number of screening out but um, it's kind of biased because it's all the patients that I've been sending. We do not have at the clinic uh, uh, for now the epithelium thickness map. We do have an, uh, uh, at the eye department, so which is exactly around the same place. So I'm sending every time I have a doubts on the topography, I'm sending patient. This is exactly this in first deepening concern I do have, and I'm sending all the time to the opto OCT. And so far, we have about 90% that are coming back with the inferred thickening of the epithelium, and then I'm taking them back for PRK. Uh, and for 10% of the case, I do see uh, this uh, inferior uh, thinning, and then I uh, put them on the keratoconus clinic uh, monitoring. So, so, so you, it's. So you've already paid for the device if you just buy it. I wish. I'm, I'm going to. You in... You're not drawing. You're probably not making writing the check. But you know. <laughs> um, 
I agree. I, I will say um, that so standard of care is a is a really interesting topic, and, and and again, in the United States, standard of care is is determined by what the average surgeon does. Epithelial thickness mapping is absolutely not standard of care in the United States right now. Um, epithelial thickness mapping will be standard of care in the next 10 years. I, I will put that out there and now may be wrong, but that's my guess because it's completely non-invasive. Uh, it's easy to add to the flow. It's hard to, uh, it's hard to argue against it. And uh, you know, it's not ruling in completely abnormal patterns. I agree. But when you look at, you know, the, the study, uh, I, I know David Varsano was on that. I don't remember the other ones, but this is, you know, a 20 year old study that 30% of patients uh, or more who come in for refractive surgery screening have a little bit of inferior steepening. They have an asymmetric pattern. Uh, so that's one in three that is in this category just from anterior curvature that you need to then divide. Um, and I think that, you know, people, one way or another, people are using other factors to divide those patients. They're either looking at thickness, regional thickness, or, and, or anterior elevation and, or posterior elevation if they're using shine fluke. Uh, and I think what we're going to quickly find uh, over time is that the epithelium is more discriminative in those eyes to really rule in or rule out uh, concern than the other metrics. Not that those aren't useful as well, but I, I, would, I would say that the, the literature is going to most likely go to where showing that epithelium is going to be second on that list. Uh, and, and therefore I think it's gonna be uh, you know, a big thing to add to the clinics. So, Marconi, we, we have here uh, someone asking about your, uh, it's a refractive surgeon here, a uh, cornea guy, uh, that is asking about your flow charts. Uh, and he's asking what weight do you give to the features such like, uh, such a eye rubbing or a topy history of anything that is related and associated to uh, keratoconus history? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, there's a difference to make here, you know. I mean, in terms of uh, a risk factor to progress a little bit faster, I would put a lot of weight on rubbing, anatopy. I think they are a risk factor to progress faster, but they are not a risk factor to develop. They, they, they are not a, a main factor to consider the patient has or we will develop a keratoconus, you know, you can have keratoconus without any eye rubbing or without any uh, allergy or anything. But I mean, they are a risk factor to progress a little bit faster. So, I mean, I will tell the patients or you treat allergy or you tell the patient not to rub their eye if they do uh, to kind of, you know, but that's another thing. I mean, that's more important to me when they are actually patients with keratoconus and uh, if I will consider or not cross-linking or thing like that. But for refractive surgery, if they are normal, if they have normal topography, uh, to me, that's not, a, that's not a main point, honestly. But family history may be, uh, although I have done surgery in almost all eyes that had family history of protoconus or anything, depending on their topography or, or, or age, you know, and so, I mean, I, I will ask and I will consider in that, but that, that will not uh, uh, make me not do surgery on those eyes. You know, on this, uh, on this panel here, 100% of the refractive surgeons uh, in the screens have rubbed their eyes in the last hour and a half multiple times. So Inclu including yeah. me. <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, I'm saying 100% of us. So, you know, eye rubbing, I think is absolutely something to tell patients who have early keratoconus or suspicion thing to not, now, you can't, you can't hide Marconi. We know you're rubbing your eyes right now. We, we know that's what you did. Uh, so I, I, I definitely think it's something to tell patients not to do specifically if they have any concerning findings, but the reality is humans rub their eyes. The only ones who don't rub their eyes are the ones who aren't aware that they're rubbing their eyes or who are actively lying to you. So using that as a screening factor, I think it's extremely challenging. I had a couple of 
yeah, as j just one more thing, because I have to ask Marconi because I got this question many times. Um, and now I have you live, I have you to answer this question about PTA and PRK. This is a question I had many times. So I think this is, uh, we have really very few uh, ectasia after PRK, but it's uh, uh, something that we have to relate to. So I'm very happy to let the uh, PTA master uh, speaking about this. So let's go, let's think about this together. Uh, first, uh, in terms of cutoff, uh, methodologically speaking, as I try to, you know, kind of, you know, delineate the path we went through to kind of come out with a cutoff for PTA for LASIK, in, in, uh, in order to do the same thing for PRK, we would need eyes with bilateral normal topography that had PRK and then went uh, uh, and then develop ectasia. And then we would need to study those eyes and understand what are, what's the cutoff for those eyes. But in fact, uh, for good and for bad, in terms of methodologically speaking, uh, is bad, but for patients is good. When we look back, all those patients that, that did develop ectasia with PRK, they actually had abnormal topography. So first step to answer your question is, it's almost methodologically speaking uh, impossible to, to find out a cutoff for as we did with LASIK because we do not have as many eyes with normal bilateral normal topography with that, that, that had PRK and developed ectasia. With that, so, so we don't have a cutoff, specific cutoff. We can have mathematically speaking, but we, we, can have, we can follow the same steps we did with LASIK for this reason that I just showed. However, uh, in terms of bi biomechanical or, or tensional, uh, tensional strain change, obviously the impact of LASIK is, let's say, uh, more important than, than the impact after PRK. And therefore, uh, probably the patient is able to, uh, let's say, absorb a higher percentage of change uh, with PRK. However, two, I would still consider 40 as a limit because to reach 40 with PRK, to reach 40 with PRK, we would need a very high ablation. So I still consider 40%, but, but again, 40% with PRK is different than 40% with LASIK. And to calculate that, which, which is probably another question that you get, how to calculate I mean, of course, to have the same parameters that we use with LASIK, we have to add the epithelium thickness. Otherwise, you would not consider the percentage. You would have just part of that. So you can just consider 50, uh, 50 microns plus the ablation depth divided by, by, by corneal thickness. If you have the direct measurements of the epithelium, it's even better. Uh, and another thing that I would like to say uh, quickly uh, about the epithelium map, just, just uh, because I remember, one of the nice things about the epithelium is not only to screen patients, you know, it's also to follow patients that had especially uh, hyperopic ablation. And if you want to, to enhance them, because as we know, uh, we have at least two, two microns uh, of thinning for every diopter we treat in terms of hyperopic treatment. So sometimes, and, and we have a limit to, for the epithelium breakdown of 32 30 microns of, of epithelium thickness. So when you are going to retreat the patient that had hyperopic LASIK, it's very important to measure the epithelium thickness, thickness to make sure that epithelium is not too thin in the apex. And you will cause an epithelium breakdown and then opacity and all that. So, so that's very important. And sometimes even, even with low case, you know, 46, I mean, not that low, but I mean, not, you, do, you don't always need 49 or 50 to have an epithelium breakdown. Sometimes with values lower than that, if it's, especially if it's a retreatment. But anyway, so to answer your question about PR, PTA and PRK, 
I mean, that's that's the point. I mean, of course, 40% of PRK is less important or less impactful, let's say, than 40% than with LASIK, but it's still a very high number. And unfortunately, we don't have the, the cutoff value specific for PRK because we don't have we cannot follow the same strict methodological method that we did with LASIK simply because we don't have enough eyes with normal topography that, that had PRK in developed ectasia. When look back at the eyes that developed ectasia after PRK in the literature, I would say virtually 100% had abnormality in the topography. So. I'm happy you treated this question. You addressed that. <laughs> And anyone asking the question, I will uh, refer him to uh, the recording of this uh, webinar. Yeah, it makes, it, makes things easier. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Neil, you had the one last question? Yeah, I had a couple of short ones. Um, we have the cutoff of 40 uh, also in your flow chart. Uh, until we have your no cut, uh, no cut off model, what do we do when we get close to 40? When I know when I have someone and I'm over 35, I start to get a bit sweaty when it's over 38, 39, it's a bit. Yeah. So because I mean, how, yeah, how much do we have to uh, be far from of 40? Course, of course, as, as any cutoff point, the higher, the worse, as any risk factor is like that. So, I mean, you can go ahead and do surgery with someone with 41, 42% and do not surgery with someone with 38, 39%. It, it's, it's up to you. What the cutoff does is just to give you a guide, a parameter, a cutoff point to help you. So to me, it's very easy. I mean, if it's equal to or higher than 40%, I will go ahead and do PRK. It's, very, it's a very easy decision. If it's lower than that, I would do LASIK because 40, it's already a very good number. You know, if, if it's below than that, it's below, it's, 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 it's below 40. I mean, I, I would be fine to go ahead and do LASIK. But again, I'm talking about truly normal topography eyes. I mean, because this is very important. You know, this is very, very important. But you can ask me, uh, if all the eyes that have a PTA higher than 40% will develop ectasia, of course not. It's a risk factor, of course not. So if you want to go ahead and take that risk to you, it's up to you, I don't. Thank you, and one last question. What do you guys think about the differences between the different uh, Scheinflug machines and uh, the ones that are more common in the market? Do you think there are differences? Do you think there's value to have more than one, like one that has combined Placido and Scheinflug and the other that's few Scheinflug? I'll tell you my answer is I, I think it's much more important to uh, really learn your own single device than it is to have more than one. Um, they don't, I, I have had over time more than one on multiple occasions. I, I physically have more than one now, but we are really only using one at, at this moment. Uh, it, much more important to get the repetition because you will I, I, first of all, I think you'll see many more similarities than differences. And on the rare case that you really do see a big difference, I, I'm not sure exactly what to do. I mean, difference between the devices. I'm, I'm not really sure necessarily what to do with that. Um, I, I think that uh, you know, from a practicality standpoint and a monetary standpoint, you'd be better off having truly different technology than you would have uh, having 90% overlapping technology. Thank you. Uh, I fully agree. I mean, that's the, that's the main point. I, 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 would, I would show, you know, just stress this point about Placido disk topography. So I would lean towards the device that have the a Placido disk topography on this, so Sirius and Galilei. But I mean, we all know that the Pentacan is able to provide a reliable topography too. I mean, so if, if, if using correct scales and all that, so I mean, I, as Brad said, you know, you have to use the device you are familiar with, you have been trained on, so I mean. So guys, I think uh, we would love to continue speaking with you because it's a fantastic opportunity to uh, finally got answer from the masters so that would be great uh, and secondly because uh, it's usually the time we go for dinner right <laughs> if we were in meeting then we would go for dinner and then uh, keep talking with that 
and so that that's very shame that we cannot uh, pursue with dinner that was uh, great to have you guys here thank you so much for uh, your insight for uh, uh, the fantastic uh, uh, lecture you gave uh, I will uh, obviously share with you the recording and uh, that will make many other uh, people happy uh, and smarter I'm sure so thanks a lot uh, and I really hope to uh, see you guys soon uh, especially you too because I love you very much so guys take care Thanks a lot again Thank for you your lecture. Yeah, and uh, thanks on yeah. behalf of uh, all the uh, refractive surgery community here in Israel. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. thanks. Take care. Thank you very much, my friend. Love Thank you. you very much. Bye. Bye, guys.